Yeah, you just, I'll give you a count, three count, yeah? Three, two, one. Welcome, everyone. We've got a debate for you this evening. The debate title will be, Are the Sources of the Resurrection Reliable? Uh, the format will be 20-minute opening statement, 10-minute rebuttal, five minutes for the concluding statements. The two participants contending tonight will be Akil Onk, who will be representing the Muslim side, and Pastor Jason Burns, representing the Christian side. Pastor Jason Burns, just let us know when you're ready, and your time will start beginning. Uh, your time will begin as soon as you address the mic, and it will be for 20 minutes. Hi folks, it's good to be with you, and thank you so much, uh, to debate me, and Yaya Snow, and others, uh, Ijaz, for inviting me. I really appreciate that. I'd like to pray before I start. Dear Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love. And Father, I pray that for all of us today, we would know your love. And so, Lord, I pray that you be in this for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Please drop in your school bag. Amen. I'd like to start uh, reading uh, Galatians chapter 1. It says, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ, and God the Father raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, Grace be unto you, peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ and to another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, then that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, then that which you have received, let him be accursed. Um, if Christianity is false, then I'm going to become a Muslim. Uh, if Islam is Inshallah. false, if Islam is false, then you need to become a Christian. And the key for the Christian is this issue of the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to start my presentation on three points. I want to talk about presuppositions, our bias, sources, and if we get time, a little bit of evidence for the resurrection. So I want to just talk about uh, presuppositions. Uh, one of the things with atheist Christians and Muslims is we don't talk a lot about our presuppositions. And um, when we look at the history of Jesus and who our Lord Jesus is, we come with certain bias. The atheist looks at the material with bias, the Christian looks at the material with bias, and the Muslim does. For example, Ernest Rayman, 1823 uh, to 92, said Jesus was a romantic visionary. H.G. Holzman, 1832, 1910, Jesus was the teacher of the timeless ethical truths. John I. Wise, 1863 to 1914, Jesus was an eschatological, te eschatological teacher figure who should be fitted into first century Judaism. Albert Schweitzer, 1875, 1965, Jesus was a failed prophet, but a towering personality. Rudolf Bultmann, 1884 to 1976, he saw Jesus as a preacher of timeless truth and was influenced by his existential philosophy. Uh, we have British uh, atheists like Christopher Hitchens, uh, who didn't believe in miracles, so he couldn't see that Jesus uh, could have risen from the dead. We have Michael Onfray, French philosopher, who... who uh, didn't even think Jesus existed, but it was his atheist philosophy that was influencing. Dominic Crossan said presuppositions are important. So I want to just say that as Christians and Muslims, we come with bias. I come with bias, and you come with bias as Muslims. Uh, Surah 15, verse 9 to 43 to 3 to 4, says that uh, the, the Quran is uh, in, in errors. And in 2 Timothy 3 16, it says the Bible is the word of God inspired. So we've got to look at the atheist presupposition, the Muslim presupposition, and the Christian presupposition. The atheist presupposition is miracles can't happen. They can't say that because at the quantum level, they don't know whether something's going to break into history or not. So the atheist presupposition is done. Then you've got to come to the Muslim presupposition. The Muslim presupposition, if we look at Surah 2 verse 1, it says, 
about the Quran, this book, there is no doubt in it. It is a guide to those who are mindful of God. So for the Muslim, the Quran is the presupposition that they're using to look at history. We see that in Surah 4, uh, verse 157, they declared we are but put to death. The Messiah, Jesus son of Mary, the Messiah of God, they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him. So the Muslim is looking at the resurrection and death of Christ, saying that Christ did not die, that it seemed as if he died, but he did not die. And that's the presupposition of the Muslim. And um, I just have a few issues with this presupposition of the Muslims. In uh, Sari Bukhari, volume 6, um, book 61, 556, it says that Muhammad forgot a verse. That's just one issue. There are many uh, surahs, uh, many um, hadiths that show that the Quranic sources are not reliable. How can it be the true word of God if even the prophet has forgot? And then I have Surah 33, 37, which talks about Muhammad, uh, that the Quran says that uh, we're not to adopt anymore. And it seems strange that Muhammad married his adopted son's wife. And it seems as if the Quran is just a production to suit Muhammad's desires. So I can't take the, the Quranic presupposition seriously. And we could go into contradictions in the Quran. It says, um, it says, uh, uh, it says, uh, was man created from blood, clay, or dust, or nothing? Uh, created man out of mere clot of congealed blood. Surah 96, verse 2. We created man from a sounding clay, from mud molded into shape. Surah 15, 26. Uh, the similitude of Jesus before Allah is that of Adam. He created him from dust and said to him, be, and he was, Surah 3, 59. Uh, but does not man call to mind that we created him before out of nothing, Surah 19, 63. Um, see also Surah 50 to 35. He has created man from a sperm drop, and behold, this same man becomes an open dispute to Surah 6, 4. So there seems to be contradictions within the Quran. I'm, I'm willing to be corrected on that. I'm not a, a, an Arabic scholar. Now, for me, I believe the Bible gives us history. It talks about uh, in uh, Luke chapter 1 that uh, Luke gathered eyewitnesses. So history for the Christian is a good presupposition. We want to know what history is all about. Sorry about this. So we've dealt with presuppositions. Now I'd like to just look at methodology. And there's so much material that we need to look at. I'm using Mike Lacona's methodology, explanatory scope. This means we look at the quantity of facts. Explanatory power, this is the quality of facts. Plausibility, whether hypothesis conforms to the background knowledge. Uh, less ad hoc, does our information just come up with ad hoc ideas or is it rooted in proper historical information? Next, we cannot just build a case of the sources, whether the sources are accurate, and West we're building on um, historians believe today. E.P. Saunders, in his book, Judaism, Jesus and Judaism, in Philadelphia Fortress Press, names a number of facts. Number one, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. Number two, Jesus was a Galilean uh, no, uh, and preached uh, and did healings. Number uh, three, that he had 12 disciples. Number four, he did his work for Israel. Number five, he was controversial at the temple. Number six, he was crucified outside Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, number seven is uh, disciple, Jesus' disciples were persecuted. We're going to look at, so I'm building, you can't say, you can't argue against the Christian faith unless you're willing to engage with modern scholarship of E.P. E. Sanders and many others that say there are these basic facts, they call bedrock facts. And I think the Muslim community, the Muslim scholarly world has not adequately dealt with this properly yet. And it needs to be dealt with. Um, so the Gospels, are these good sources? Tatian, the Assyrian, a Christian theologian, theologian lived about 120-118. He used uh, the, the Gospels, showing you that the Gospels were before 180 AD. 150 AD, just in March, the first apology, goes to the Gospel of John. Eusebius, the historian, says that Papias uh, of Heraclius talks about the writings of Matthew and Mark when Papias wrote about five volumes. That puts uh, the Gospel of uh, Matthew and Mark into the first century. Uh, Polycarp, a disciple of John, in his letter, Philippian Church, he quotes from the Gospels and other New Testament books, 100 AD. The Didache was a teaching text and used widely by the church. The writer quotes for, uh, from Matthew on, on the Lord's Prayer. In 95, that was 95 AD. Clement quotes Matthew 
in uh, 1 Clement 13, 1, 2. All this evidence shows that the Gospels are first century documents. Notice that the Quran is 600 years after the Gospels. No eyewitness material, no real historical information. Yeah, and what we've done here by looking at these sources, uh, the early church fathers and writings, the, the Gospels come within the first century. Some books you could read, John Arthur Thomas Robinson, The Theological Ribble, uh, Liberal, John W. Wayneham, Professor of New Testament Greek and Biblical Scholar, uh, Gerger uh, Gerhardsen, Swedish Professor at Lund University, Michael J. Jaus, a French Biblical Scholar, Jean Karen McNack, a French scholar, Philip Rund, a French scholar, Karsten Peter Thie, German, and read a popular article, The Only Eyewitness of Jesus by J. Warner Wallace. So we've established the Gospels are in the first century. Uh, we read uh, this in Ignatius' letter. Jesus Christ was of the stock of David. He was from Mary. He was truly born, ate and drank, was truly persecuted under Pontius Pilate, was truly crucified and died, and also was truly raised from the dead. His father raising him. Ignatius based his comments on the Gospels. You know, at least three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and uses them often in his seven letters, Ignatian's letters to the Trillians, 9-4, chapter 9-4, uh, J.N.D. Kelly, Early Christian Creeds, London. Uh, also uh, noted uh, the Gospel Truth by Paul Barnett, IVP, 2012. Ignatius wrote about 110 A.D., so puts the Gospels as first century historical source material. The next the important thing is to note the Gospels are accurate historical documents. This is from Bible.org. Uh, in Bethesda, in John 1, 4, 4, this text tells us Andrew and Peter came from that city, that they were fishermen and archaeologists have discovered a plethora of fishing implements in, the, in a house in Bethesda, therefore confirming the Gospel of John as being historically accurate. Cana, John chapter 2, verse 1 and 11, archaeologists who think that curb at Cana is the place where Jesus did the miracle of turning water into wine, found storage facilities of water pots. Uh, M.T. Gerzim, uh, sorry, Mount Gerzim. John comments on this mountain, John 4, 19, 23. We know the Samaritans worship on this mountain, and it's clear that John's text, he alludes to this. We also have texts of the Samaritans from the fourth century AD, which have within the earlier tradition of Messiah expectation. This can be seen in the Samaritan woman's reaction to Jesus. Samaritan text, let the restorer come safely and sacrifice a true offering. The restorer will come in peace and reveal the truth and will purify the world. Jesus replied to the Samaritan woman, Messianic question, I who speak to you and me, uh, John chapter 4, 25, 26. This is basically rooted the Gospel of John in first century uh, historical context. The pool of Bethesda. John describes a pool called Bethesda in John 5, 2 in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate. Uh, von Walt writes, the discovery of the pool proves beyond a doubt that the description of this pool was not the creation of the evangelist, but reflected accurate and detailed knowledge of Jerusalem. Tiberius, John is the only one to identify the Sea of Galilee as also the Sea of Tiberius, John 6, verse 1, 21, 1. Herod Antipas, Tetrarch of Galilee and Perea, 4 BC to 39, moved the capital, capital from Sephorus to Tiberius in about AD 24. So he reflects the change in political times. That's in the Gospel of John. And now, number six, Pilate's judgment seat. In John 19, 13, Pontius Pilate brought Jesus to the judgment seat. And this has been identified near the Hedorian Palace, Hedorian, Herodonian Palace. Now let's look at the uh, reliability of the Synoptic Gospels. We looked at the Gospel of John. The inscription about Pontius Pilate. Pilate is mentioned in all four Gospels. An inscription of Caesarea uh, Maritima was found with his name on its prefect of Judea, which is the southern region that encompassed Jerusalem. Number two, the boy Jesus in the temple in Luke 24, uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 41. Fifthly, the discovery of a stairway south of the southern wall in the Temple Mount makes it clear that it was here that the young Jesus amazed the rabbis by his knowledge. This was the place the rabbis came to discuss the matters of the law. So Luke knows intricately the, uh, the architecture of uh, the temple in Jerusalem. A wine press, stone walled terraces and three towers. I'll stop there. I could go on and on about the historical detail of um, the gospels. Uh, you can read the historical reliability of the gospels by Craig Lombard. 2007, the New Testament documents are the reliable FF Bruce uh, as a, a way of reading into these topics.
Now let's look at the Gnostic Gospels. The Gnostic Gospels, the, the word comes from ancient Greek word for knowledge. A Gnostic is someone who knows a knower. What does he know? It, is, it was secret teaching. When you read the Gnostic Gospels, the Armani literature, the Nag Hammani literature, they are all about secret knowledge. In contrast, you find that the Gnostic texts do not anchor Jesus in historical time. For example, Pilate is not mentioned, uh, very, Pilate is mentioned very little. Galilee comes only once in a Gnostic text. As for biblical gospel, Pilate appears about 60 times. Galilee is mentioned almost uh, six, uh, 60 times. Nagamani Gnostic text, Jerusalem is only found 16 times, and the comments lack historical uh, reality. The biblical gospel mentioned Jerusalem 70 times and know the city intimately. Matthew 21, 12, 6, uh, 11, 15 to 18, Luke 19, 45, 47, John 2, 12, 16, Matthew 24, 1, 2, Mark 13, 1, 2, Luke 21, 5, 6, Luke 21, 1, 4, John 2, 20, Luke 21, 20. The Gnostic gospels were compared to the biblical gospels like historical detail, which the biblical gospels are full of. So what we're seeing here is that our gospels that we're reading then they're not only um, near the time, they're also displaying an accurate knowledge of the area where Jesus lived. So there is information that we can use to know whether Jesus died or rose again. Finally, the Gospels are eyewitness account. And this is, a, this is scholarship that the Muslim community needs to engage with and hasn't engaged with yet. Uh, this book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, and it'd be interesting to have another discussion on this, as recently in 2007, uh, and the reason is uh, Richard Balcom has, has, has gone to uh, um, ancient uh, sources, uh, Roman and Greek biography, and has found that uh, the Gospels were written uh, based on Greek and uh, Roman biography. And one of the things about that is that the Gospels want to use eyewitnesses because the Roman historians, the Greek historians, based their ideas on a guy called Polybius, who was a second century uh, Greek and who said that one must use, um, one must use eyewitness material. So, um, so the following evidence comes from the eyewitness of the gospel, uh, sorry, the gospel is eyewitness testimony by uh, Richard Balcom. It is the contention of this book that in the period up to the writing of the gospel, Gospel traditions were connected with name and known eyewitnesses. People who had heard the teaching of Jesus from his lips and committed it to memory. People who had witnessed the events of his ministry, death, and resurrection, and themselves had formulated the story as they told. These eyewitnesses did not merely set going a process of oral transmission that soon went its own way without reference to them. They remained throughout their lifetime the source, and in some sense that may have varied for figures of central or more marginal significance, the authoritative guarantors of the stories they continue to tell. The significance of that statement is this. Since Rudolf Bultmann, many scholars, most scholars have seen that you go to the Gospels and realize it's just a patchwork of late community. And what, what uh, Balcom is saying here is that, no, actually there were guarantors of the tradition, that there were certain key people like Peter who guaranteed that the material would, would be passed on and maintained as truthful. Also, in this book, he talks about the inclusio. Mark, says Balcom, Mark in, inclusio makes Peter the principal eyewitness in the second gospel. The inclusio is a technical term that Roman and Greek historians use that they didn't actually use the name sometimes in the sources, but at the beginning and at the end of a, a, a book, they would hint indirectly that they were using a certain source. And uh, in this book, um, Richard Balcom goes into full detail uh, about this. Uh, and, and Bart Ehrman has made a response to this, but the academic world has, 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 has really began to move uh, quite, quite, quite a lot now in the favor. Even Elaine Pagels, who is a, a Gnostic scholar, admits there is eyewitness material now in the Gospels. And that's quite a remarkable thing that's happened in the academic world. How long have I got, guys? You've got one minute. I've got one minute. Yeah, well, one minute and 15 seconds. So what, what we've done here, we've looked at presuppositions. This is a massive scholarly area that even academics are not tackling properly today. We've looked at uh, number two. 
we've looked at um, the uh, the early that the gospels are early source material. We've looked at uh, that the gospels are accurate source source material, talking about the historical times. The third way we've looked at the um, the important the scholarship uh, by uh, Richard Balcom about eyewitnesses. Thank you very much. Well, thanks a lot, Pastor Jason. So, um, Akil, I'm j I just want to remind both participants, you've got to stay on topic. This is a debate about the sources of the resurrection. So um, j just remember to stay on topic, and I'll give you a reminder when you've got one minute. So, Akil, your time will commence as soon as you address the mic. Okay, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, <coughs> was salatu, was salam, wa rasulillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, uh, Mr. Burns, uh, for first invite for the debate um, and also for the presentation. And uh, I want to get right into the point. I want to also make a disclaimer. I apologize for my voice. Um, it may be a little bit um, coarse. I had um, some, some cough um, this past week, so I'm just getting over that. But Alhamdulillah, in time for the debate, and hopefully it's well enough uh, to convey what we want to cover. So the topic is, is the sources uh, of the resurrection of Jesus reliable? And I want to look at this in five points, as well as bring some other uh, surrounding um, evidences to make the case here, to show why we believe, at least as Muslims and other sources as well, um, that they're not actually reliable. So um, there are five sources, uh, five points that's taken from some historical um, uh, presentations. Historians note these points as, as things that they like to see when they're looking at historical documentation to verify whether it's reliable or not. As well as I went into the Islamic sciences to bring also a couple of sources to show on um, the veracity of Islamic sciences in comparison to Christian uh, sources and use that to examine um, the New Testament um, as a reliable source for the resurrection. When one wants to examine any narration of history, there are a few key factors that historians say must be in place when trying to obtain the closest and most accurate depiction of what actually occurred, if it occurred at all. From amongst them are the following, coupled with conditions from the Islamic sciences of Hadith verification, and I think that we will find is noteworthy when we conclude. The first one is contemporary eyewitnesses. Now, um, Mr. Burns, he, he concluded with this by mentioning, uh, citing uh, Richard Balcom's testimony that they're eyewitness, te uh, eyewitness in the New Testament. Um, when we look at uh, contemporary eyewitness testimony, um, this is our position. There's not a single eyewitness testimony or a single eyewitness reliable testimony in the history of Christianity until the present day. Um, that can account for any such event of the resurrection or anything else. The crucifixion, that's just the bottom line. When we examine the gospel writers, because this first in, uh, in terms of uh, the Bible, we look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. None of them are eyewitness testimony to the fact. Maybe with the exception of, someone may quote John, but this is contingent and we look at this as we go along. Luke and Mark are not even con uh, contemporaries or disciples of Jesus, so they can never be eyewitness testimonies. Um, but there's not a single eyewitness testimony. When I say eyewitness testimony, someone that was actual eyewitness that wrote and testified to the fact. You can tell me there were thousands of eyewitnesses, but where is their testimony to the fact? In the court of law, if you don't have the testimony from eyewitness, you have absolutely nothing. So to say they were eyewitnesses, even quoting uh, and citing Richard Malcolm, what eyewitnesses' testimony do we have in any of the books of the New Testament? The belief in a resurrection, and that's all it is, is a belief, is based on an inference from the belief in the crucifixion, which we'll touch on shortly. This inference comes from the ideology of Paul, because Paul is the one that said that if Jesus did not die and rise for us, then our, our faith is in vain. 
um, we, we are led astray in so many words. So this idea of the resurrection, crucifixion and resurrection, is the idea of Paul, who's the first writer of the New Testament literature. Um, and we believe that the following Gospels are a mirroring or a reflection of this ideology that Paul proposed early on in uh, the first century of Christianity. We continue, but as it relates to there ever being a single, reliable eyewitness testimony to the event, in any fashion, no such person has ever existed. And this is just reality. And I, I would challenge uh, Mr. Burns to bring me one single eyewitness account who testified to the crucifixion or the resurrection. The existing accounts that we do find in the Bible about Jesus were not written at all by any contemporaries of Jesus or eyewitness testimonies um, to the fact. So not only is there not a contemporary eyewitness to the event of the resurrection, but there's not even a contemporary to give any eyewitness testimony to any event of the life, life of Jesus um, that we find as mentioned in the gospel. Another point that the historian, that's point number one. Point number two is another story, uh, uh, fact that historians like to see is multiple independent transmissions. They like to see that the account is repeated. And you have that in the New Testament. You have four gospels. So these gospels writers are writing uh, about the same event. So you do have this. But the problem is, given the fact that there is not a single eyewitness testimony and transmission of this event, and in particular, we're talking about the, the, the resurrection, then certainly there cannot be multiple independent transmissions of it. Even though you have four gospel writers and you have another writer by the name of Paul who writes um, at his own um, uh, independence and his own authority, according to his own testimony, but none of them are eyewitness testimonies to the fact. So even though there are multiple transmissions or there are multiple um, books on the life of Jesus, they're not written by multiple eyewitness testification. So by default, the Bible fails this point as well. Point number three, and this will be our longest point, so I ask you on uh, your patience to bear with me, but it's very um, informing here. Uh, consistency and testification of the narration, that there's not major contradictions in the stories. So let's say, for instance, the four gospel writers were eyewitnesses, um, but now we have to look at their stories and examine it. Are they consistent with each other? And if they're not consistent, then why? And this is also a, the a theological problem because according to Christian belief, and Jason can correct me if I'm wrong, but the Christians believe that the Gospels are, are, are inspired by God. So even though they were not eyewitness to the fact, like for instance, Mark and Luke, who were not disciples of Jesus, they were inspired by God. This adds another problem because if they were inspired by God, then you should find no contradictions amongst the books. Yet you find major and serious contradictions uh, amongst the four Gospels and even the, um, the Acts and the, um, the books of Paul, that is of Paul. So as for the narration of the account that we do have to examine, which are only found in the Bible, and I want to state this clearly, that when we look at, uh, we say, sources of the resurrection, the primary and really only source that Christians can rely on, rely on is the Bible itself. There's not a historical shred of evidence whatsoever coming from the first century up until the 21st century um, that anyone can say um, outside of the biblical text supports the resurrection. It would be inference, it would all be something speculation, but there's not a shred of evidence outside of the New Testament. And the New Testament is what we want to examine now. So when we look in, into the New Testament, um, the Bible, we have serious and unreconcilable differences. The first of them is that the biblical texts, as we have them now, since the inception, are written in Greek. And a classical elite Greek uh, at that. Yet the disciples of Jesus, who were eyewitness testimonies, they spoke Aramaic, even according to the Bible, were illiterate. And this is a big problem because when you find the first writings of the um, New Testament, even though we don't have the original autographs, but even if you take the first copy from those, it's still written in a high educated Greek. The disciples were not educated. They didn't speak Greek. So that means that someone else besides them had to write these accounts. According to Acts 4.13, um, two disciples, Peter and John, who John 
he, he writes the, um, the last of the four Gospels, and his Gospels, the latest coming at the end of the first century, even some say the second century, begin second century, he's considered to be illiterate. So an illiterate man writing 70 years, 60, 70 years after the fact about the life of Jesus and his Gospel is considered to be non um synoptic because it, it contradicts in many ways the other three. Uh, and he's an illiterate man. And he's writing in a classical type of Greek. This is the problem because it, it's not consistent. It doesn't. It doesn't meet. You know, saying the, um, it doesn't meet the standards of uh, historicity in terms of evaluating sources. Also, internal evidence make this point clear as well. By the way, of several contradictions. So when we examine the stories of the New Testament, and we find all of these contradictions. It undermines the authenticity and reliability of these documents as we have them. For instance, what day was Jesus crucified? This is important because, again, if this is inspired by God, then this should be something that should be accurate and no, no contradiction. If it wasn't inspired by God, then it's a historical problem. So no matter how you look at it, as an inspiration or as history, it's a problem. Who carried the cross? Was it Simon or was it Jesus? This is a problem, historically, as well as um, uh, inspiration-wise. Uh, who went to the tomb? Uh, who were seen at the tomb? Did Jesus and his disciples ever leave Jerusalem, or did they stay? Um, these are clear problems that we have in the New Testament writings that have serious contradictions that undermines, first and foremost, its historicity or its historical reliability, as well as its idea or claim of inspiration. And inspiration is a bigger problem because now you're placing the mistake on God. And we say, I will be Latin and We see God's protection from that. All of these are contradictions. These contradictions are serious enough to render the narrations of the accounts unreliable. Now, I have a few questions on, on this uh, fact, or this point, point number three. Why was Jesus, and this is something for us to think about when we look at the intertextual um, analysis of the resurrection story. I want us to think about, you know, even if we take this on face value, that their sources are, um, are has been protected, and it goes back to the time of Jesus. When we actually read the story itself, there are many things that 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 stands out that just doesn't make sense to us. That would give credence to the story itself, rather they undermine the story, and this is important. So I have five quick questions that I want to examine, and then we move on. One is, why was Jesus disguised as a gardener supposedly after the alleged resurrection? If Jesus had died and he had rose again, why was he disguised as a gardener according to John 20, 15, and Mary Magdalene thought he was the gardener? This is something that we have to answer, answer to because it, it would make no sense for Mary, someone who knew Jesus very well and who some people call her the beloved servant, I mean, the beloved uh, companion of Jesus, uh, some, some list her as that, why would she not recognize him and think he was a gardener? Question number two, why didn't the disciples of Jesus recognize him and believe in him? We, we read in Luke chapter 24, 11, Peter says the idea when Mary came back after telling them that Jesus had resurrected or Jesus was gone, he was in the tomb, he said, this is fables, this is nonsense. Now, this undermines the idea and the, the, the idea that Jesus prophesied his death and resurrection. If Jesus prophesied his death and resurrection, why would he, uh, why would the disciples say the idea of him being resurrected be nonsense? So uh, this undermines that idea. And many scholars also don't believe that Jesus prophesied his death and resurrection. And Paul says, according to the scripture, that he would die and be raised up again uh, three days and, uh, after three days, according to the scripture. There's nowhere in any scripture that says that. So Paul is quoting scripture, but what scripture is he quoting to, uh, to support his claim? We don't find it nowhere in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Number three, why did Jesus seem so hungry? When we, uh, when, we, when we look at his life, we find Jesus, um, he ate, he broke, he broke bread, and then again he appears to his disciples uh, after being with them for a half a day. They didn't recognize him. And then he, when, he, when he met them, he asked them, do you have anything to eat? The point here, this, this is a theological um, problem for us. If you're saying that Jesus conquered death and he's resurrected, 
and he's no more dependent upon his physical body, why is he continually eating and asking for food and obviously appearing to be hungry? Is these are things just to think about. When we look at this story, we just can't take it on face value anymore. We have to examine these things. And, 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 and looking at these things logically is part of the examination. Question number four, why did Jesus refuse to leave Jerusalem and also command the disciples the same? As we find in Acts 1, 4, Luke 24, 49, 43, he says, stay here in Jerusalem and don't go outside of this area. So why is that? The, the, the contention is that because he's still evading, the people who tried to kill him, he don't want to make himself broadcasted to people, so he's staying low-key, as we say. Um, and this was, was, was understood from these kind of events. He's disguised. He's not being recognized. He's appearing and not appearing. Um, he's saying, don't go over here. Um, and then the fifth question to, to, to complement all of this is, why didn't Jesus just appear to Pilate and those who ordered him to be killed from amongst the Jews um, to prove that he truly conquered death and was who he, who he said he was. If Jesus had truly conquered death and resurrected and know that he cannot be killed anymore because he's a resurrected body, why not appear to all of these people and why not have his appearance recorded by eyewitnesses in mass? Paul is the only one that says he appeared to more people like over 500, but where from amongst those 500 is any eyewitness testification to that fact? We have absolutely none. Absolutely none other than what the Gospels provide for us. And like, like we mentioned, we believe the Gospel writings are mirroring or portraying of the theology that Paul proposed early on since his writings was the first. So this is point number three, and we have five questions there. We move quickly to point number four, which is authenticated, complete chain transmission. And these last two points are taken from the Islamic sciences, and we move them very quickly so we can get to some points uh, to mention um, in closing, but an authenticated, complete chain of transmission means that if you have a testification from someone, they can relate who they got it from and relate who they got it from back to its original source to verify that this source is uh, as veracity meets standards. If I say something now that something happened, how can you verify it happened unless you could trace it back to someone? Similarly, like we have our family tree. How can you claim to be from this descendant or have this people in, in your genealogy if you can't trace your family tree? We can't believe the Bible on face value because the Bible or people say you should believe in the Bible. I want to have something substantial and concrete in order for me to base my belief on it. And when we look and examine the New Testament, we just don't have that. That's the reality of the matter. And then the fifth point is verification of the people that we do have in the chain. So when we look at those people that actually exist in this narration, we can look at their character, we can look at their acumen, we can look at things about them and say, you know something, this person is reliable, he said this from this person, and on and on like that. We have none of this whatsoever as it comes to New Testament uh, literature and history. And if one makes a claim that, well, this wasn't the way of the people of old, um, this is just not accurate. Because the people of old were very uh, particular about citing their sources. For instance, we have an article that was written um, by a gentleman by the name of Matthew Ferguson. Um, he has a very nice article, article and he mentions 10 points as it relates to history and verifying sources, um, but I only dealt with five that I got from other sources and from the Islamic sciences, but he mentions ancient historical works at the beginning or someone else within the body of the narrative are often preface with statements from the author about the period they will be investigating, the methodology they will be using, and the types of sources they will be discussing. None of the Gospels, with the exception of a very brief statement at the beginning of Luke, even come close to following this convention. And this is, this is pre-Jesus time. This is um, third, second, first century before Jesus and afterwards. So we can't say it didn't exist because it's clear it did exist. This was the style of those who wrote history. And we have a, a list of, uh, of historical writers um, that done such and follow such standards. But he says, none of the Gospels, with the exception of a very brief statement at the beginning of Luke, even come close to following this convention. Furthermore, the opening of Luke is hardly substantial enough to consider it, consider it of the same caliber as actual historical prose. As scholar Marion Swords, and he notes this from the Oxford Annotated Bible, page 1827, he notes the in initial four verses of the book 
or a single Greek sentence that forms a highly stylized introductory statement typical of ancient historical writings. After this distinctive preface, however, the narrative shifts into a style of Greek reminiscent of the Septuagint. As such, while Luke mimics some of the conventions of historical writing at the beginning of the gospel, the rest of the narrative reverts into storytelling typical of, of other gospels. Uh, so this is basically the conclusion that they make. The, gospel in, the gospels in the New Testament basically um, boils down to being uh, on the same part as a novel because it has nothing that we can really use to validate uh, its historical sources and use um, to, to, to prove that. Uh, I think my time is coming to a close. You've so, got uh, one minute. You've got okay. one minute remaining. Uh, one minute. Um, I want to say some other things, but um, I, oh, quickly, um, um, Jason, he cited um, Paul about the gospel and preaching another gospel. I want us to keep this in mind as we go out through this debate because it's interesting that Paul is contending with other people about his view of Jesus. Paul never knew Jesus. He was very ignorant of Jesus. It is many things that he never quote or talks about Jesus. I mean, for instance, Paul never talks about um, the life of Jesus. He don't cite spiritual resurrection, nor does he, I mean, he cites only as spiritual. He doesn't cite the, the empty tomb. He doesn't cite the virgin birth. There's many things in the life of Jesus that Paul leaves out. Why? Because of his ignorance of Jesus. Yet, over 50% of the New Testament is written by Paul. The major theology of the New Testament is written by Paul. Um, the whole doctrine of crucifixion and resurrection for salvation is introduced by Paul. Yet, Time. this individual Paul is not a reliable source for us to depend upon. And because of that, we have to conclude that the sources of the New Testament or the resurrection is not reliable. Thank you. Right, Jason, so you've got 10 minutes to respond to Akil, and your time will begin as soon as uh, you commence. I'll give you a one minute warning at the <laughs> end as well, so, you, so you, you, can help, you can keep track of time as well, okay? Okay, you challenged me uh, about uh, eyewitnesses. Uh, I was given in scholarship that the academic world has not fully dealt with properly. It's only since 2007 that Richard Balcom's book has been out and uh, it's rocked the academic world. Even an atheist, Dr. Crosley at Sheffield University uh, admits that this is a very powerful book. Uh, Dr. Burridge has written uh, extensively on it and the academic world is coming round to the view that there is eyewitness material in the gospel. That's just a basic academic fact. And Oxford University and Cambridge need to catch up with Sheffield University and other academics in the field they are actually seeing the, the, the light uh, on that issue. Uh, in John chapter 1, it says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen. Are, we, are you ready? With our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifest with us. There's no eyewitness account concerning the Islamic view that Jesus didn't die, but we here have eyewitness material clearly stated in 1 John. And you can read a number of areas in the Gospels that it's based on eyewitness material. Um, so that's the, the one point dealt with. Um, second point, uh, historical multiple independent sources, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, in, Matthew, um, in Matthew and uh, Luke, uh, there's 92% of Mark within those Gospels. However, there is 500 verses in Matthew that is not in any that is independent of Matthew, and there are 300 verses in Luke that are independent of Luke. What you see here is that there are independent historical sources. There are four independent historical sources in those Gospels, and one of the things that the academic world uh, and it's and uh, Boltman has, has crumbled now in the academic world. But the academic world was hampered by Boltman's ideas about sources behind the Gospels, the Q source and what have you. And we need to, the, the academic world need, and, and, and we need to look at this a, a lot more objectively rather than polemic. There is much more sophisticated uh, historical writing going on in those four Gospels than even the academic world is willing to admit. Uh, on the issue of consistency, 
Um, I'm just trying to consistency. Um, uh, I, I can't remember what that issue was there. But consistency, um, all Dominic Crossan says that Jesus died under Pontius Pilate. But if we just look at the consistency in the academic world here, just for a second, if I can get the, the notes. Sorry. I just want to deal with this issue of consistency. Consistency. Bart Ehrman says, one of the most certain facts of history is that Jesus was crucified under the orders of Roman prefect of Judea, Pontius Pilate. Um, liberal Dominic, Dominic, Crossan, Dominic Crossan, that Jesus was crucified is as sure as anything historical ever can be. And there is consistency. You can, you can point to all these minutiae, what happened here, what happened there, they seem to be contradicting each other. But all the Gospels and all the New Testament writers are consistent that Jesus died and rose again. All the minutiae detail that if it was doctored, they'd make it all perfect. But because it's not all perfect, it shows you they've not doctored the information. So there is a, a, an honest consistency there by showing the difficulties within the text. They're being honest. If they were lying, they would hide and, 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 and bring these, uh, get rid of these. The other thing I'd like to say is that we have uh, Josephus testified in the Arabic translation uh, that Jesus died under Pontius Pilate. We have Tacitus who clearly states and he makes it clear when he's using the source, uh, if he's using the source from Rome uh, and whether he's not using the source from Rome and he, and he makes it clear uh, that he's using sources where he's saying that Jesus died under Pontius Pilate. We have, um, we have, um, uh, a letter from Pliny that says the Christians believed Jesus uh, was God and, and, and they, were, they believed that Jesus uh, was to be worshipped. That is a letter showing the Christians were being persecuted for believing in these things they were testifying to. So we have uh, Lucian of Samosa, we have Thallus, we have many sources outside. It's ridiculous to say that we don't have any of these sources. Only internet atheists, my friend, will say these kind of things. No reputable scholar Dale Orty is not a reputable scholar. Uh, Dr. Price is not a reputable scholar in the academic world on historical Jesus studies. These are fringe scholars, and, and the Muslims are getting their ideas from these kind of people. Uh, and, you know, Bart Ehrman would not agree. Um, linguistic studies uh, on the issue of uh, the, these people were, were not educated. Well, Muhammad was not educated, but he was supposed to have written the Quran. But linguistic sources, we've discovered thousands of manuscripts in the ancient world, in, in, in Egypt. And we found the Nag Hammani literature, and it shows that there was much more higher literacy than even scholars are really willing to engage with today. Uh, uh, another example is, um, is uh, if you take, sorry about this, my eyes are, are not very good. But um, you can see here, we found a document uh, in the ancient world in, in Egypt. It says this, I am Isis, the queen of every land. That, that document clearly shows that when Jesus says, ego I am, in the Gospel of John, that John is being honest and, and, and saying what Jesus is saying because it's rooted in the language of that time. The other thing as well about uh, John, John Bunyan, for example, was, a, was one of the most uneducated people of his time, yet he wrote the greatest one of the greatest books ever lived, which was Pilgrim Progress. So just because uh, you're not educated doesn't mean you can't write uh, amazing books or scholarly works. So that's prejudicial. The other thing as well is uh, John, um, I'm just trying to think, I'm getting a bit tired now. Um, well, I'm just thinking about John. Uh, oh yeah, fishermen were not that poor in those days. Actually, it was quite a wealthy uh, job to do. So, you know, it could have been more educated than you realized, had resources. The other thing as well is people did have access, access to key libraries in central areas that Rome provided. Another thing as well is that slaves uh, were taken from various parts of the ancient world and uh, they were educated. They could have been used as emanuenses for uh, gospel writers if need be. So uh, I've lost my, my train of thought now. Oh, yeah, here we are. So that's dealing with... Um, John couldn't have written it because he was not educated in Greek. Um, contradictions, Dale Allison has said that eyewitnesses generally get the minutiae wrong, but they never get the big details. Dale Allison is one of the great academics of our time. He doesn't believe what I say. 
So these minutiae issues are not the are, are just a, a small screen. The big issue is nobody in the academic world of any repute actually says that Jesus didn't die. They all agree with that. And all the main academics agree, even Dale Allison, who disagrees with me, they all agree that even the disciples believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And then finally, uh, a, a landmark book that no Muslim scholar, no Muslim debater should go without reading. N.T. writes The Resurrection of the Son of God, did an extensive study on, uh, on the uh, resurrection. He looks at all the ancient sources, Jewish and Greek sources, and this is the killer argument that cannot be defeated. He says, there is no difference between pagans, Jews, and Christians. They all understood the Greek word Anastasia and its cognates and other related terms as we shall meet to mean new life after a period of being dead. Pagans denied this possibility. Some Jews affirmed it as long-term future hope. Virtually all Christians claimed that it had happened to Jesus and would happen to them in the future. All of them were speaking of the new life uh, after. That's uh, in page 31 of his book, uh, The Resurrection of the Son of God by N.T. Wright. The significance of that statement is, no way in a million years as a Muslim or as an atheist or Christian or anybody can say that they had visions or they were lying or anything like that. You see, the Greeks, the Jews, they believed in a physical resurrection. So no Jew would say Jesus rose from the dead unless they actually believed it. One minute. They believed it. So I've not dealt with all, his, his, all, his, all the points that he said, but I, I hope I've dealt with as many as I can. On the, on the scholarship, my friend, he, he's not in touch with on the scholarship. He can quote from a dictionary. I'm calling you for books, books that I've read that you can go and read for yourself. Thank you. Right, thanks a lot, Pastor Jason. So, Akhil, the same applies to you. You'll get a one-minute alert at the nine-minute mark, and your time will begin as soon as you're ready. evidence which I thought was interesting and I thought going to go with a little more detail and that he didn't um, some positions uh, he didn't, didn't went to the Quran um, about the Quran um, not being trusted because of um, some things about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and his marriage to one of his wives um, Um, so let's start here. Bible gives us history. Um, this is a statement that um, Jason mentioned that the Bible actually gives us history. We're not negating that there's historical uh, elements in the Bible, even um, Bar Army calls them like kernels, like of truth that you find within it. But you also find things that's not accurate in it. For instance, um, there's a difference that's a point of the points mentioned, the difference between uh, hagiography and biography. So it says, the Gospels, in contrast, are not historical biographies. They're not historical biographies, but can be more aptly described as hagiographies, written in unquestioning praise of their messianic subject. Although the genia of Christian lives of saints developed after the Gospels, they can still be regarded as hagiographical uh, in that they function as laudatory biographies um, praising the subject rather than a critical biographies as a good representation of the scholarly consensus about the rhetorical aims of the Gospels. So basically what the Gospels are is the writings that's praising someone um, in this particular incident is Jesus, um, but not really being critical and looking at history as related to that. Um, so no, we don't accept that uh, the Bible is valid historically because it, it, it deviates away from the historic norms of giving us historical documentation. And uh, Jason has brought nothing uh, to answer my arguments about that. He said he maybe try to cover as much as he can. Unfortunately, he didn't cover much at all. Um, uh, modern scholarship fact uh, about um, the Bible. I think if you look at modern scholarship as we see the Bible on uh, the uh, modern scholarship 
uh, in fact, fails uh, the Bible as it relates to being a reliable source for many things um, because of its problems uh, that, we uh, that we mentioned in our opening statement. Um, he mentioned Quran being 600 years later than um, the, uh, old, um, the, the, the Gospels. I wonder if we can put a stop to this whole idea of the Quran being 600 years later. Um, this is something that Christians have to stop using because it actually goes against you even more so. Um, the New Testament writings are over a thousand years after the Old Testament writings. And there's gross contradictions from the New Testament to the Old Testament. So if you wanna use this argument of the Quran being 600 years later after the fact of Jesus of Islam and how could the Quran get anything right about him because it's 600 years later, how could the Old Testament be um, uh, a source um, that's talked about a New Testament and the New Testament comes over a thousand years later, nine hundred to a thousand years later, and quotes, uh, I mean, quotes are wrong, quotes are not there, uh, things are mistaken. For instance, uh, we have in Matthew, the prophecy that's forged, where he says that uh, out of Egypt, my son came out of Egypt, or I took my son out of Egypt. Um, when you look at this passage in Hosea, that's talking about, it's talking about people worship idols, got nothing to do with Jesus. So this is a gross misunderstanding of the previous scriptures that's being forced to try to make Jesus something that they wanted him to make, make him into. Um, so this argument about the Quran 600 years later, it's a terrible argument that Christians are using and it backfires on you when we apply the same standard to you in the Old Testament. Uh, so in the future, Jason, I would advise don't use the argument because it becomes very embarrassing. Um, Ignatius' testimony of Jesus, in a theological point on this, uh, on this here, Ignatius' testimony of Jesus, he testified that Jesus being uh, someone that had human nature. Uh, on a theological uh, plateau, the resurrection makes no sense because if you say God died, that's a problem. Now, we, we, we're not discussing the Trinity, but we need to keep this in mind that who died on the cross? Was it Jesus? Who resurrected Jesus? Was it God? So when you, when you look at these things, theologically, the resurrection um, makes no sense. Um, but that's something we can discuss later on. It came to mind as he was mentioning it. Uh, Gospels were rel reliable. Um, the Gospels, unfortunately, are not reliable. Um, and, and, and that's the reality of the matter. And we gave some examples of that. Contradictions, uh, no eyewitness testimony. He mentioned eyewitness. I mentioned eyewitness testimony. I want someone to testify uh, who's eyewitness. He mentioned the first John. I want to ask you, who wrote the book of the first book of John? What John is it? There were several Johns at that time. What John actually wrote this one? What John actually wrote the first, the, the gospel John? Um, this discussion amongst Christian scholars and biblical scholars of who these people are. We don't know anything about them. The names of the writers of the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they came much later after the gospel, the, the writings themselves. Who put these names on these these writings, and why didn't any of the gospel writers ever themselves mention who they were and say, this is my work, and mention their name? Matthew written in the third person. John written in the third person. Luke written in the first person, but he's not a disciple or eyewitness. Mark is the first person to write. He's the youngest of all of them, yet everyone copied from him. So when you analyze this literature, it's just so many problems with it that you cannot accept it to be reliable. That's just the reality of the matter. That's what we're dealing with. Um, does it give some historical facts of what happened? Yes, it does. But is this enough for us to base our, uh, our salvation on? Uh, no, it's not. And I'm still waiting for uh, Jason to bring me one eyewitness testimony, for instance, to the crucifixion, to the resurrection. Bring me something from one of those who've seen it and wrote about it from their own, in their own words. Matthew and Luke independent from Mark. Um, yeah, he mentioned a small section which shows what? That, okay, they had other sources. But again, if Mark is the youngest of all of the, the people writing in age-wise, yet he's uh, the earliest writer out of the Gospels, and Matthew, supposed to be an eyewitness, is copying from a person who wasn't there, I mean, what does that say about your literature? I mean, examine this, think about this. I mean, this is, this is serious stuff to consider. You have someone who was an eyewitness writing about Jesus in his life, and then people who supposedly was eyewitness copying from him. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, consistency, Bar Ehrman says so. Um, Bar Ehrman, uh, he is a, a secular writer and a historian, and he's, he's writing uh, from a secular perspective. But if you use Bart Ehrman to substantiate the fact that he's given credence to things that happen according to biblical testimony, 
you don't use Bart Ehrman to justify the resurrection because Bart Ehrman doesn't believe in the resurrection. Why? Because he doesn't, he, he, he doesn't feel, as a historian, he can verify supernatural occurrences. Now, the discussion is not about the, the Quran or the Quran position, but it's necessary to bring here the position of the Quran on the, on the crucifixion is that it was a supernatural um, occurrence that happened in which God saved Jesus supernaturally. So we're not expecting people like Bart Ehrman or anyone else to, to believe in the Quranic picture of the crucifixion, just as you don't expect him to believe in your story of the resurrection. So if you're going to hold um, Bart Ehrman as credential, uh, as, um, as verifiable for the crucifixion, but yet deny him for the resurrection, then I'm going to use your same principle to show why he don't even believe in the crucifixion because a supernatural event occurred. Just that he don't believe in the earthquakes. He don't believe in the whole world going dark. He don't believe in the curtain spitting. He don't believe in zombies running from the grave. All of these things happen at the same time with the crucifixion. Why don't Bart Ehrman believe in these things as well? So you can't call him for the idea of Jesus dying, but then even all the other things that happen at the same time that supposedly was historical in the Bible, but there's no historical documentation or facts or testimony to it. You can't have your cake eat it too, Jason. I'm sorry. Um, Joseph, Josephus and Tacitus. Um, this is redaction. Uh, Josephus mentions very little. He does mention about Jesus, but again, he's just quoting from what the Christians said. He wasn't an eyewitness. And neither, neither was Tacitus. The late first century, going to the second century, they're not eyewitness testimonies. Bring me someone that's seen it and wrote about it, and that we can look at the document to see whether or not it's valid and reliable or not. You don't have any, and we're still waiting for it. Um, Muhammad not educated, but wrote the Quran. That was not a point that we was making. The point we was making is that you have early documents written by people who cannot write in another language. And the Quran is a miracle. In that, in, in that sense, um, the people who wrote the Gospels, were they really believing they were writing God's word? When Luke stated in the beginning of his Gospel that I'm writing because everyone else is writing and I see fit to do so, is he saying I'm writing because I'm inspired by God? Did Luke believe he was writing God's word? I don't think that he believed that. Neither did Matthew, neither did Mark, neither did John. Uh, but nonetheless... You, you've got one minute. Okay. Well, less than one minute, 30 seconds. Sorry. Okay, all right. Um, so, and then he mentioned access to key libraries, which is important. If there was access to libraries, that means that, um, that there was serious academic literature being written. How come the Bible doesn't follow the same genre in terms of its literary, its literary style and academic approach to history? Um, I'll close with that. Right, thanks a lot for that. Uh, to end the debate on the part of uh, Pastor Jason, he'll have five minutes to conclude, and likewise with Akil. So take it away, Pastor Jason, when you're ready, please. Okay, uh, on the issue of uh, academic work uh, with uh, writers it says in uh, Luke it says for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth an order of declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us even as they delivered them unto us from the very beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word it seemed good to me also having got made perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write unto the in order most excellent Theophilus uh, Luke uses the Greek word eyewitnesses it gets it's the exact Greek word that Polybius uses in the second century BC. Polybia said you must use eyewitness material. He was the household name in the first century AD. He wrote in the second century BC. All the main historians in the first century AD, uh, Josephus, Tacitus, and all the others copied, uh, Lucius uh, Samosa copied, and Luke copied Polybius. They wanted to use eyewitness material, my friend, and that is where modern scholarship is going at the present time, realizing this. Um, eyewitnesses, um, We'll get, we'll, get, oh, uh, we'll get to more eyewitnesses in, in the minute. It says uh, it, the, we have historical record of Phallus, 52 AD. It says uh, there was a darkness. We have record of Pliny the Younger, 61. Suetonius, Tacitus, Marsarabian, Philogon, Lucian of Samosa, Celsus. Uh, we have uh, the historical record of Josephus, the Jewish Talmud. Uh, all these uh, sources are outside sources. And it's what is called multiple attestation. When you get enemies telling you that things have happened on the, the other side, it tells you 
that that's probably something has happened. And uh, that's why uh, Gerd Ludemann, an atheist, said it is historically certain that Peter and the other disciples had experienced after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. That's why Bart Ehrman, you said, uh, believed in the, the, that Jesus died, but he didn't believe in the resurrection. But Bart Ehrman would agree, as well as uh, Gerd Ludemann, the atheist, they would agree that the disciples believed and saw a resurrection. And you've not engaged with any of the scholarship of uh, Richard Balcom, where it talks about inclusio. I said right at the beginning that scholarship has begun to see these eyewitnesses. We have what is called the inclusio within the Gospel of Mark. That is indication that he's using Peter's material. And I, and I give you a challenge. Compare Acts chapter 2, Peter's sermon, with the Gospel of Mark. And they are very similar, showing you that Mark is rooted in Peter's eyewitnesses, uh, as an eyewitness. In Mark chapter 6, verse 9 and 11, John chapter 20, verse 1, 118, we have Mary Madeleine, Matthew 28, verse 9 and 10, we have other woman, Luke 24, 32, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 5, we have Peter, uh, Luke 24, 13, 35, Mark 16, 12, we have the Emmaus disciples, uh, 10 disciples in Mark 16, 14, Luke 24, 26, 42, John 20, 19, 25, 11 disciples in John 20, 26, 31, 1 Corinthians 15, 5, Seven disciples in John 21, 125. 500 brethren in 1 Corinthians 15, 6. We have James as an eyewitness, 1 Corinthians 15, 7. 11 disciples in Galilee, Matthew 28, 16, 20. Mark 16, 15 to 18. And 11 disciples in Acts 1, 3, uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 3, 12. Are we saying that uh, Peter and Luke and all these disciples were lying? Are we saying that, or, or are you saying that uh, Allah deceived these people and they've gone on uh, being deceived? Uh, where is the evidence to back up the Quran's claim that Jesus didn't die? Who, who was it uh, that did die on that cross? Uh, and also it is important, and it's not a way of, you, you can't get out of this, my friend. The Quran came 600 years after you. The, the Old Testament is a different ball game to, 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 to the Quran. The Old Testament has been verified hundreds and hundreds of times of being historically accurate. The, uh, the liberals said that there were no Hittite empire. Uh, the, 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 the Old Testament had got it wrong in the 19th century. L late in the 19th century, we found information that there was an Hittite empire. The, the Old Testament was proved to be right. The, the actual um, writing of the Quran uh, has never been shown to be very historical, and the Quran doesn't claim to be his, a historical. You've got one minute. But uh, we, we, have, we have, sorry, when you want information, When, when you want information, sorry about this. We have 89 confirmed facts by scholar, historian Colin Hermer in, in the uh, book of Acts. 80 confirmed facts. He's a scholar, he's a skeptic, but he says there are 80 facts based in the Gospel of Luke. We have 59 historical confirmed facts in the Gospel of John uh, by, uh, by Craig uh, Blomberg. Uh, the Quran has nothing like this, has no historical detail. If it does have anything about Jesus, it, it, it uses the infancy Gospels, which, which are Gnostic Gospels, which are later than the four Gospels. I've given you solid historical evidence to show that the Gospels are early. I've shown you that they're historically reliable. I've given you cutting edge research in N.T. Wright and Richard Balcom. And uh, your arguments are mainly theological and, um, and, and uh, maybe a few questions here and there which I've not been able to answer. Uh, but there we are, that's, that's where I finish. Time, thank you. So, Akhil, if you wanna just end off with your five minutes, um, you'll have to unmute your mic. Okay, bismillah. Um, so in closing, um, the topic was um, all of his sources uh, of the um, resurrection uh, reliable. Uh, this is what we ha come here to discuss, are the sources of the resurrection reliable. Um, so what I presented um, was historical look at uh, the sources themselves. And basically the only true source that we have um, is the Bible itself. Um, because this is where everything originates from. So we looked at some aspects, eyewitness testimony, uh, consistency, and, and things like that. 
Um, and now I want to get into something in closing, and then I'm going to address some of the points that um, Jason made in closing. But I want us to look at when the, when the gospel, because this is a question he asked that we have to consider. When we're looking at the gospel writings, um, what happened in the time of Jesus is things happened. And then people, for some time, there was a lapse. There was nothing happening. There was no one writing any gospel down. Maybe for 25, 30, 35 years, there was basically silence uh, that was kind of taking place at that time. And then people begin, from their memories and from oral culture, to kind of rewrite what they remember from the past or what they heard from the past, stories being passed down. In that kind of activity, people are trying to remember things. They're adding stories. They're adding things. And they're dressing up history. So you have history, but it's shrouded by a lot of uh, folklore and a lot of uh, exaggeration. And I'll give you, I'll give you an example. Um, um, Thucydides, for example, in his preface and history of the Peloponnesian War, he says, now, as much as particular persons gave speeches, either entering the war or when it was already taking place, it has been difficult for me to remember precisely the exact words that were spoken, either from those that I heard myself or from those that I was informed of by others. And so my practice has been to make each speaker say what I regard as the most suitable words that the occasion demanded, while I hearing as close as possible to the general sense of what, the, what was actually spoken. So basically what he's saying is this, I can't give you exactly what happened, but I'm gonna fill in the blanks and give you the best of my ability, and I'm gonna add some things and take some things away. And this is what happened to the, 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 the New, New Testament. From the very beginning, from the very beginning, it was plagued with people adding things to it that wasn't there. Unfortunately, Paul came first, and he introduced a theology, and people came along and followed that theology and added later. Um, and this is what you have. So now in our present day, we have history shrouded by storytelling, by folklore, by things that really wasn't uh, happening. And this is why you have so many uh, contradictions and inconsistency. That's the reality of the matter. And this is a, uh, a work that's being presented on the New Testament. Um, eyewitnesses in Luke. He keeps saying about eyewitnesses that Luke called eyewitnesses. Where are his eyewitnesses? What's their name? What eyewitnesses is he referring to? To say I got it from eyewitnesses means nothing unless you tell me who those eyewitnesses were. I don't know the eyewitnesses Luke got it from. And we can't infer that Mark got it from Peter because there's similarities there um, only. I mean, we need to hear from the fact that even Mark wrote this gospel because the gospel attributed to Mark doesn't have Mark's signature on it. You believe it's from Mark. This is what you believe, but there's no signature of Mark. And why would Mark write a gospel about Jesus, taking information from Peter, if Peter was eyewitness? Why not Peter write the gospel? How do you have a non-eyewitness, a non-disciple of Jesus, writing more about Jesus than those who was with him? It, it doesn't make any sense. It's reverse history. You don't take information from somebody that came later, and then someone that was there, copy from someone that wasn't there. It's the opposite way around. But you're telling me that because there's similarities in the gospel of Mark and Peter, Mark must have got it from Peter, yet Peter didn't write it. He didn't write the gospel. There's no gospel of Peter. So that's not, that, that, that's, that's not in the Bible anyway. There used to be. One minute. Um, huh? One minute left? Um, so I went to testimonies. You mentioned all these verses. We don't have any testimony from them. We have someone saying that this person seen this and this person sees that. Where is their documentation? Where is their gospel? Gospel? Where is their letter? Where are them saying, I seen this and my name is such and such? So we can verify who they were, not someone appending a name to our writings, uh, 100 second century. Um, now names become put on the gospel writers uh, that was there. Uh, this is unacceptable and it's not historical. Um, I mean, there's a lot of information uh, to go over. Our time is short, but I think these questions are something we have to consider. We have to really look and examine how is the historical presentation of the Bible backwards from the normal standard history of writing, even from that time. It, it doesn't add up and it doesn't conform to reliable historical writings. Therefore, we have to conclude that the sources of the resurrection, which is primarily the Bible, the New Testament itself, is not reliable, and we cannot rely upon it as a, a, a historical document for such an activity. Is there any time left? No. Okay, thank you. That's it. And I close.